Hello everyone, I'm Udayan, and today we present Printflatables, uh, which is a system which allows you to print human scale, functional, and dynamic inflatable objects. And this work would not be possible without our collaborators, Harpreet Sarin, who will be presenting with me today, Patrick Shin, Yasuaki Kakehi, Jifei, and our advisors, Paddy Mice and Hiroshi Ishii, all from the MIT Media Lab. Here's a chair that was fabricated with our system that supports a human weight, and as you can see, it's being used in our lab. And as you can see from this particular slide, the object goes from being from a folded state to a three-dimensional shape, which then becomes to a chair through a series of transformation. And all these transformation behavior is enabled by a primitive folding mechanism that, that's embedded in the object itself during the fabrication process. And this is sort of what the primitive folding structure looks like. And with this embedded folding mechanism, we started with the question of how do you fabricate load-bearing large inflatable structures? And in the process, to explore possible things that could be fabricated, we built this machine to automate. And we explored how you could then go on to make a range of objects like these. And these objects demonstrate how it becomes easy to make large load-bearing structures ranging all the way from the chair that I showed you earlier to couch and maybe even a football goalpost. And the idea of using inflatables for large structures is not new. People have been trying to fabricate inflatable structures and use them at different scale for play, decoration, indoors, furniture, and what have you. However, in the 1960s, architects put forward a vision for pneumatics showing how they could be used for architectural structures like buildings, uh, living environments, furnitures, and other complex air fill forms with pressurized air. And this was possible and owing to the primary benefit that comes from pneumatics, which is their lightweight and ability to rapidly deploy these structures. And in the field of soft robotics, researchers have used some of these techniques to make human-friendly robots, owing primarily to the compliance and soft nature of the material that's being used. And some of these, as you can see, some of these uh, uh, robots work alongside humans, and some of them go on to be part of a hu human body. And however, their focus is mostly on locomotion and articulation, and not on the fabrication pipeline of inflatable objects. In HCI, these concepts are relatively new. And because of the advantage of morphing behavior, researchers in HCI borrowed these concepts to make shape-changing interfaces. And in WIST 2013, a paper from Tangible Media Group, uh, Nui introduced shape-changing interfaces with uh, actuators which are made of elastomeric material. Uh, however, their fabrication method was mostly manual. And sticky actuators by Ryuma, also from Tangible Media Group, demonstrated inflatable pouches that could be attached to passive objects to actuate the object itself. And this was one of the very first efforts to look at how to uh, automate the fabrication process of these actuators. And Jife from uh, Tangible Media also, uh, in WIST uh, 2016, presented Aeromarf and showed how you could embed the actuator in the object itself instead of fabricating an external actuator. Uh, however, the actuation mechanism, which they call uh, the hinge, is a, a flat piece of fabric which becomes compressible, and it doesn't scale to large load-bearing structures. And referring to the previous visions of pneumatics uh, from architects about building large load-bearing structures, and in contrast with Aeromorph, uh, we started looking at how do you make large-scale structures uh, that are cap capable of taking loads and applying forces. And that becomes our research question on how to integrate actuation and structure in a single object for large-scale inflatables. You can go to Walmart or a Home Depot store and buy uh, inflatables. And commercially available infl inflatables such as these, rafts, boards, and things that you can play with are fabricated in the industry mostly through manual processes. 
And common practices involve the use of impulse sealers, heat rollers, and RF sealing mechanism. However, a commonality between all these techniques is applying heat and pressure to seal two layers of fabric. And for our purposes where scale and load bearing capacities is desired, we use an inextensible material similar to what's being used in the industry. But however, the material is coated with a, uh, with, with a special uh, uh, plastic which melts when applied with heat. And as you can see from this table, we, we can use materials with different strengths for different applications. And to fa fabricate our object, as I said earlier, we take two layers of fabric and apply heat and pressure to create seams and define the shape of the object. However, an additional step that we do in the process is introducing a fold in one of the layers. And this fold then goes on to become the actuation mechanism that's embedded in the object itself. And we call it the mountain actuator. And when we were submitting the paper to uh, the conference, we were thinking about what should we call the actuator? What name could it be better than a mountain? In contrast with uh, Boulder. So now uh, let's go through the details of uh, the mountain actuator. An analytically derived equation shows the dependence of the angle on the geometry of the mountain, uh, in particular its height and width. A naive way of understanding this equation is a larger mountain results in greater folding angle. An alternate way to increase the folding angle is to position or, or uh, distribute a number of mount mountain folds across an object. And experimentally, when we were playing with these objects, we ended up distributing a number of mountains and we uh, uh, noticed some interesting behavior. As you can see on the left, there is a discrete folding angle and by distributing the uh, uh, mountains evenly, you can then get a continuous folding behavior. So these objects sort of become uh, a primary part of most of the objects that we are gonna talk about in the rest of the uh, uh, presentation. And to ease the process of designing and fabricating them, we built a custom machine uh, and a design and simulation software. Uh, let's look at how one of these mountains is made on the machine. <clears throat> the first step in the process of uh, forming a mountain is feeding in two layers of fabric. Uh, using the rollers as we show in this figure. Here's the machine performing this action. Two of these rollers push the fabric forward, resulting in bunching of fabric at one end, and that's how we actually make a mountain actuator. And this is how the machine actually does it. Once the mountain is formed, a pincher with a heated plate temporarily seals the mountain, and it is then forward to a, to a 2D heat sealing bed for further sealing. And in the heating, uh, and the, in this 2D sealing area, a heated iron on an XY gantry goes over the mountain to complete the sealing process. And this is what we get out of the machine. The result is a simple object with an embedded actuator. Our software takes a 3D model as input from the user, decomposes it to 2D output, simulates the inflation, and generates G-code for the machine. We'll go through all of these steps in detail now. The user actually makes or imports a solid model in Rhino. This is a screen capture of our Grasshopper extension that we built for the users. Uh, it extracts a skeleton from the solid model and then flattens it to a 2D plane. This becomes the input to generate the machine code for the final object. And the flat op output consists of mountains encoded in this flat uh, output that is generated, um, whose distribution on the objects can be then parametri parametrically controlled with the sliders that we have for the user. And the user can then proceed to actually preview the inflation in the next step and visualize how the inflated object will look uh, in the simulation tool that we have. To run the simulation, we use mesh relaxation techniques in uh, Rhino uh, and Grasshopper. Uh, we, we, we utilize Kangaroo's inflation physics engine to run the inflation based on the constraints that we provide here. A step after, after the simulation is generating the G-code, the XY gantry that we showed previously is operated through standard G-code. 
We generate custom G codes for other steps mentioned previously, uh, such as dispensing the fabric and mountain generation. And owing to the merits of load bearing and uh, force actuation in our technique, we decided to fabricate examples of pop-up architecture and body wear. Here is the same furniture that we showed in the beginning of the presentation. The flat fabricated object consists of a number of mountain actuators, each folding to 90 degrees. Uh, upon inflation, the objects transform to a chair, which can bear the load of a person. And we noticed different inflation pressures give it different form factors, example, turning it to a couch uh, when lesser inflated. We were also thinking to print an inflatable swimming pool, but summer never arrived in Boston, so we never happened to do it. Uh, we also made inflatable blinds for a vertical window where inflation deflation sequence uh, regulates the amount of light in a room. And uh, we did preliminary testing on the load bearing capability of this mountain actuator. Uh, actuators with one, two, and three mountains resisted up to 15 kilograms of weight. And after this, we decided to do uh, body wear inflatables. As an example, we integrated an inflatable in a t-shirt of a person, uh, showing the compliant nature of these actuators. These actuators, when spread over an elbow, act as a soft exoskeleton for the user. The next example shows the finger actuator with smaller mountains bending at two points. You can imagine people designing these actuators, visualizing the output, and printing these actuators as per the requirements, and even embedding them in their apparels. The automation pipeline consisting of custom hardware and software uh, enabled us to explore fabrication of a wide variety of inflatable objects. These examples ranging from a bicycle helmet to a football goalpost demonstrate how easy it becomes uh, to fabricate all these personalized inflatables. The current limitations of the machine uh, include removal of excess fabric after we fabricate an object. In addition, uh, within the current scope of the machine implementation, Structures with only unidirectional folding behavior have been implemented and are possible. So far through the examples, we demonstrated inflatables with two layers. However, we also explored stacking more than two layers to fabricate multi-layer pneumatics, as in the figure on the left, which can be used to actuate physical objects in a, in a living room, for example. We also explored how inflatables can be modularized. Uh, the modules can mesh with each other, and a preliminary investigation showed a structure like this can take up to three to four kilograms of weight while itself weighing 250 grams, actually. So far through our examples, we actually showed all these examples and our summary and the primary contributions are an actuation mechanism that can be embedded in an inflatable object, a machine that helps fabricate these objects easily, and a software that helps you design and visualize these objects before you actually go and print them. With our automated hardware and software, we explored a wide variety of inflatable objects. We foresee designers taking a lead in this and taking advantage of our system to make personalized inflatable objects. And our work also points to a future of rapidly deployable inflatable structures at architectural scale. With this, we would like to open up to questions as well. Thank you. Hi, um, Hui Xu from Cornell. Uh, really great work. Uh, I'm wondering, so, so for now you are using this mountain um, structure that can basically bend like in, you know, playing like in bi-directional uh, bending mechanism, right? Uh, have you thought about like, if you can like, for example, have this uh, mountain valley not just parallel to each other, but have some like fun angle, uh, maybe you can just like bending in the three-dimensional that can like exp expand like your application in the future? Uh, like for now, you're like have the mountain uh, structure that's like parallel to each other, right? What if like you have the mountain structure that's not just parallel, but maybe have different angle? Maybe you can just like bend not just like in one plane, but in like three D like space. Right. Does it? Uh, we we did uh, we did explore some of those examples while we were working on the implementation. However. Uh, the implementation that we were focusing on right now was, uh, you know, like forwarding the one mountain, which, which actually kind of restricted us to do unidirectional folding. 
Uh, we did actually explore when we actually insert a third layer and insert a mountain in a different direction. That gives a folding behavior in a different direction. However, we didn't create uh, too many examples because it increases the complexity of fabrication. All right, thanks. I will add one more question. So this is a pretty sophisticated machine. Can you talk a bit about the hardware iteration you did and what was the most complicated part? Yeah, um, so when we started out uh, to sort of automate and build the machine, uh, we looked at Nadia's cardboard prototyping kit. Uh, however, uh, we wanted something which can scale to a large uh, area, working area, as you have noticed. Uh, so we started by work, uh, taking existing machines uh, with uh, strings, for example, and built a large one by one meter working area. Uh, but then the complex part in the machine is not the x, y uh, motion, which is a solved problem. So we just uh, sort of, you know, like uh, took regular gantry to uh, actuate the x, y, z. Uh, but the feeding the fabric, which involves the use of the rollers, and then uh, creating the mountain and then pinching them. So all of this involves uh, quite a few sophisticated kinematics. And um, for example, you might want to grip the top layer of fabric and not the bottom. How do you do that? So there is a fair bit of work that's gone into the sequence in which the wheels grip the material and the friction between uh, the type of the wheel that's being used. It's a specific kind of polyurethane uh, wheel. And all of this is discussed in the paper. OK, thank you so much.